Thank you everyone for joining us today. Uh, so we are all set to get started now. Uh, for all of our YouTube uh, live attendees, can you please uh, let me know if you're able to hear me fine? If you can just put it in the chat box, I'll be able to know. Okay, I can see Alex has confirmed that uh, you're able to hear me fine. Okay, then we are good to get started now. 
So hello everyone and welcome to ASME's A Day in the Life webinar series brought to you by Engineers for Engineers. I'm Aditya Sharma and your host for today's webinar. First, I hope you're all staying safe wherever you are. For those that are attending our event for the first time, what's the purpose of this webinar and what's A Day in the Life webinar series all about? You probably wondered at some point what a day in the life of a mechanical engineer working at top companies like Lockheed, SpaceX, Raytheon would be like. Now you have the chance to find out through this interactive webinar series. In a minute or so, I'll introduce uh, our guest speaker of today, but first let me tell you how this webinar will work. Starting with some housekeeping, all webinar participants are signed in in listen mode only. So please type in any question you might have in the dialogue box on the webinar platform anytime during the webinar. All questions will be answered after the introduction of our guest speaker. In fact, Q&A session will be an integral part of this webinar. You may ask any kind of questions, whether it's related to the mechanical engineering field, the company, the industry, career related question or any question related to speaker's job or current position. So far, those who are not familiar with how YouTube Live works, this is where you can type your questions. As you can see right on this uh, text column, you can put in your questions. Simply type them in the chat box in your YouTube control panel as shown here. We'll probably get a lot of questions so, you'll do, so we'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the webinar. So let's get started and introduce you to our guest speaker. Please meet uh, Carlos. Uh, Carlos, why don't you start your uh, video and introduce yourself? Hello, good afternoon. My name is Carlos Hurtado. I am a senior mechanical engineer at Raytheon Missiles and Defense in Tucson, Arizona. I've been with the company for about seven years now. I previously worked at a different aerospace company in California, relocated out here for my new role at Raytheon. One of the main reasons why I took the job at Raytheon was because I wanted to take on some new challenges. I had been in my previous company for about six years and a couple internships. So I was ready for a new adventure as well as moving to a different location in the US. I am currently the uh, responsible engineering authority on several different components and sub-assemblies on one of the missiles that my company makes. Um, I have a aerospace engineering degree, bachelor's degree from California Polytechnic State University in San Luis Obispo. And I currently am responsible for the mechanical and electrical design and integration of several different components to assist with the guidance section <clears throat> in, in uh, missile technology that we have. I've worked on several different missile programs in the years that I've been at Raytheon. One of the things that I enjoy the most is being able to solve very difficult technical questions uh, to help assist with the manufacturer, design, test, and eventual um, being able to deliver the product to the to the warfighter. I currently support defense missiles. In the past, I've also worked on strategic missiles that all actually deliver payloads uh, to different targets. The main focus right now we have is for defending the US and allied ships out at sea and in defense of their assets and people on the waters, international waters that there are. So I'm excited, very happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And I look forward to addressing any and all questions that you may have. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Carlos, for this great introduction. Let me now begin the Q&A part of this webinar. And while we wait for the first questions from our attendees, Carlos, let me ask you a question to get started. So what is your typical day as a project engineer at Raytheon like? That's actually one of the main advantages that I enjoy about my job is that there is no such thing as a typical day. So we start every morning. Our supervisor has a team standard meeting to go over uh, the items that we have really on deck for the day. And it changes every day based upon what's going on. 
So for example, we could have test events coming up for our missile testing um, out in the coast of California. And sometimes we would have to do activities to support the test events. Other days there may be issues with the factory or with the supplier that we would have to resolve. Such issues include not being able to deliver the hardware on time, having manufacturer or design issues that we need to assist either the supplier or the integration center at. Or sometimes we would actually have to rush to scramble to be able to export some of the items that we have. Uh, one of the things that uh, I actually found very interesting that you don't really get to learn too much about in school is all the different regulations associated with exporting our missile technology internationally. One of the missile programs that I support has a, a big, large, several preference in different countries such as Spain, such as Greece, such as the UK. And the US government is very strict on how we're able to export a lot of that technology. So we actually need to perform engineering assessments where we compare our missile technology to what is identified in the regulations for export. Uh, through some other medium, for example, movies or TV shows, you might have heard about some of those regulations, um, but you don't really get an appreciation for them until you're actually on the front line and need to assess accurately what we have, what we're trying to accomplish in order to export these items. And so it's very chaotic sometimes. Um, other times we may have a lull period. And so we're working on being able to shore up our mechanical and electrical designs for either what we have planned down in the future or even what we call a block upgrade, which would be a major upgrade to our missiles. Such missiles upgrades include adding a new rocket motor to extend the range of our missiles. And that has a very large reaction, chain reaction to the rest of the components that we need to update for example, that larger rocker motor may actually change the mechanical response and frequency response of a lot of our components. And so we may have to do a new structural analysis and thermal analysis based upon the, the larger loads imparted by the rocker motor, whether it's vibration or shock to the rest of the missile. And so those assignments are really fun because you're actually able to get back into the design wheelhouse, which would be very, very fruitious for us because we're able to then hone our some of the skills that we learned in school, being able to shore up our models that we have and being able to do new analysis based upon what is already done and really investigate the differences. And for a mechanical engineer, that's really exciting because that's really where the rubber hits the road, being able to redesign for a new block upgrade for a missile. Great, thank you so much, uh, Carlos. So Carlos, what do you like most about working at Raytheon? I really enjoy the technical challenges that we come across. So being able to work with our customer on the missile designs that we have and being able to really, really get at what they really want, because sometimes what they want and what they need is not the same. And so being able to resolve some of those differences with the customers is really exciting and really fun for us. Um, that because we can also use that experience to really shape where the missile is going to go whether it's a new defense against a new kind of threat, whether it's a UAV, whether it's a different threat technology that the ship needs to be protected against, that gets really fun and exciting because we're able to then leverage our different solutions that we have from a mechanical design standpoint and being able to work with other disciplines such as electrical engineers or computer engineers, software engineers or electrical, that's really exciting because you realize that the mechanical discipline is just one branch of what needs to come together in order to design a missile that's gonna meet its requirements and protect the warfighter. I enjoy that because you're able to work with others, being able to reach across different disciplines. And in the meantime, you actually build your own design acumen. So for example, one item that I knew I needed to develop was in my electrical design phase. So when I was in school, you took a few electrical engineering courses, whether it's circuits, uh, whether it's advanced materials for electrical design, whichever, but you don't really get to apply those too much within the mechanical job until you start interfacing and interacting with the electrical engineers. And so we really work together with them to be able to develop a packaging solution for storing the electronics and protecting them, um, as well as developing thermal management solutions, whether it's heat sinks or other 
um, options to help mitigate some of those thermal impacts. Being able to work with them, I actually got a chance to be able to expand my scope. And that's really fun because you're able to grow your career. You're able to show upper management that you're excited about learning something new and something challenging. And so that is really exciting and fun because you're able to work with something new, being able to expand your scope beyond just your typical mechanical design, whether it's GD&T, whether it's design interfaces, whether it's tolerancing, whether it's structural or thermal solutions. Being able to work with electric folks is really exciting because you're then able to be sure that you're able to not just work on your mechanical widget, but increase your scope and be able to approach the solution from a systems engineering perspective. That sounds amazing. And Carlos, just to let you know that we have about 60 plus live attendees on our YouTube channel and we are flooded with questions now. Okay, so I'll try to cover as many as we can. So my next question is, uh, Carlos, if you could add a new college engineering course based on your work experience, which one would it be? So I would definitely add some of the basic analysis that you don't learn in school that we apply every single day at my career. So one of the courseworks that I would add would be able to do bolted joint analysis because when we're able to put together all the different assemblies, you need to really understand the different materials that you're clamping down. It's not as easy as just selecting a, uh, a crest or a metallic screw because you need to really understand what it is that you're gonna be interacting and facing. So part of that too would be incorporating what we already learned in school from a structural analysis standpoint and being able to really assess the, the torque, being able to also improve our geometric dimensioning and tolerancing. I remember when I got out of school, the, one of the very first thing they did was send me to geometric dimensioning and tolerancing training to get a better understanding. And if you're able to take advantage of those opportunities, whether it's an internship, uh, whether it's a series put on by ASME, I definitely recommend them because that's something that you're gonna use every day. And if you really want to improve as a mechanical designer, some of those fundamental analyses for bolted joints and for geometric dimensioning and tolerancing will really come in handy and really form the foundation of your mechanical design tool chest. And then from there, you're able to expand into doing other types of analysis as once you have a firm grip of your basic foundational analysis skills. Great, thank you so much. So uh, Carlos, uh, what do you, uh, so, okay, sorry, would you please describe the Raytheon hiring process? Sure, so they really go for two sets of individuals, uh, really looking for both the college hires and the professional hires. So my personal experience was a professional hire since I had worked for a different aerospace company in California. I had been there for about six years and had two internships with that company. And so for me, I actually started out uh, with LinkedIn. I remember I created my LinkedIn profile probably about three or so months before I was contacted by a recruiter. Um, it was a, not a Raytheon recruiter. It was a recruiter that was contracted by Raytheon um, to look for potential uh, individuals that were looking for a job. And to be honest, at the time uh, where I was contacted by, by this recruiter, I wasn't really interested in, uh, in obtaining a new job, but I decided to keep my options open. And the first thing they did was do a phone interview. So I did a phone interview probably about a week or so after I was initially contacted by the recruiter. Um, they focus uh, very heavily on the technical skills they wanted to learn about my, my design experience. And I had done mechanical design, I had done a little bit of propulsion engineering design work as well at my previous employer. And so I was able to talk through those and uh, it went really well. And then I actually came out here for the in-person interview. Uh, they flew me out from California to Arizona for the in-person interview, probably about a month or so after my phone interview and got a chance to meet with what we call department managers uh, to be able to share with them in person my experience and um, what I had done in my previous job. And so I think it was about a panel of about four or five different department managers within the mechanical engineering design directorate. 
Uh, department managers are essentially your boss's boss. So as an individual contributor at Raytheon, I have a section head who is my immediate supervisor. And the boss of the section heads are what we call the department manager. So it was really a layer above my supervisor that actually did the interview in person with me. Um, it was about six hours in the morning and then got a chance to break for, for lunch and then came back and did another two or three hours uh, with a, a different set of department managers. And they wanna get as many folks involved as possible to get a really good understanding of, of the candidate. And uh, it went really well. I was able to not only share my technical experience, but also the what we call the soft skills. They're really interested in not only can you do the technical work, are you also able to work well with others to accomplish the task? And that's because um, at Raytheon, it, you can't really design a missile with just one discipline. I mentioned earlier the different disciplines that need to come together and really have a systems engineering approach to solving the, the very technical solutions that our customers expect from us. And so they asked me about working with others, what are your strengths and also what are your weaknesses? Um, one key aspect of the company is they also always want us improving. And so that includes working on what are your perceived weaknesses, whether by yourself or others, and what can be done. Develop really a plan to, to be able to hammer out your weaknesses and get you either more experience, more training. Um, might be a stretch assignment as well to help grow you professionally in this career. They also focus on what are some of the um, awards, some of the recognition that you've received in the past. I was able to share some of those recognition events and, and items that I had received in my previous employer. Um, they're also looking for folks, not only that are good technically and can contribute and work well with others, but they also want to see what are you doing to bring out the rest of the folks. So for example, are you a good coach? Are you a good mentor? What have you done? Do you take initiative, not only just in your technical work, but also helping develop others? And that's really key because in the aerospace industry, uh, there's been a lot of folks that have been retiring recently. Um, there is a big disparity between the, the younger folk coming up and those that are more senior, especially in the technical engineer realm, to be able to take over and learn as much as you can from those folks that have 20, 30, 40 years of experience um, actually, yesterday I found out that one of my coworkers was going to be retiring, and she has been with the company for about 38 years. And so that's a lot of knowledge that was gained over that time, um, not just from a program management standpoint, but also from a technical standpoint that needs to be passed on to the next generation of engineers that will be coming up through the company to be able to take on those really difficult challenges and being able to share what some of those lessons learned, some of those experience. We call them scars sometimes as well, just because you go through so much, whether it's failures, whether it's opportunities for learning. A lot of that knowledge is very valuable and uh, the company was really big on expanding that knowledge down. So after the in-person interview, I found out about two or three weeks later that I was gonna be offered um, full-time employment. Initially, I decided not to take it just because I was really enjoying my previous company about a month or so in the, my previous company, they actually had terminated the missile program that I was working on. This is done at the, at the government level. And so at that point, I decided that it was time for a change and for a new challenge. And so that's why I decided to take the full-time offer here at uh, Raytheon and I relocated here from California to Tucson for the new opportunity. So that was my experience as a professional hire. And I'm sure it's different for college hires I actually participate in a couple of uh, what we call uh, college hiring events, where they actually bring in students from all over the country uh, to be able to share some of our experiences from um, professional hires and really what it is that we're looking for for the candidates. I have other buddies as well that actually participate in uh, phone interviews and screenings. So it looks like the process has changed a little bit, which is okay. And they actually have opportunity to be able to screen over the phone potential college hires. And I think that applies for both interns and, uh, and full-time college hires as well. Great. Carlo, this was really, really helpful. 
so my next question is, uh, what are the opportunities for a fresh graduate from foreign country that have a keen interest in such fields or technologies to get an internship or full-time opportunities at Raytheon? Yeah, it's a really good question. Um, so in the aerospace industry, it really depends on what product you'll be working on. Um, and the reason why is because some of those products, not based upon what the company institutes, but because some of the customers institute um, that they be US uh, nationals. Um, so you really need to navigate the waters and be careful about what it is that you'll be looking for and find out from the beginning whether even that type of opportunity is available for you. Um, there may be opportunities for international um, people to be able to work on some of the technologies that we have. Some of the technologies that we have also require uh, security clearances. And so some of those may be challenging for a foreign national. Um, but if you either have dual nationality or are interested, um, some of those opportunities may be limited, but I still recommend that you try to find as much as, as you can. Um, I found through my experience that the best way to learn about these types of opportunities is, is really building your network. Uh, it, you know, there's the old saying that says, it doesn't really matter what you know, but who you know. Um, some of that really applies to our field. In fact, uh, the very first internship that I got uh, was because I knew a senior that was gonna be graduating uh, when I was in college. And he was gonna go work for full-time for the company that I was interested in. And so I was able to build uh, my network with him, be able, able to get to know him really well and stayed in contact with him after he graduated. And uh, he was actually able to match me up with the, the hiring director at uh, my first internship. And that's really how I got in. Um, so building your network, reaching out to folks is really what I would first recommend, whether it's through LinkedIn, whether it's through different social media. Uh, there's a lot of folks out there that are willing to help out um, also, if you have an opportunity, whether it's through a club at your college or university, that's one of the best ways to really get to know a lot of people as possible. Right now, that may be challenging based upon the current environment, but once things change, I highly recommend being able to just put yourself out there. Um, sometimes engineers have the, uh, the stigma or the uh, perception that we are really introverted or, you know, not as socially adept, but, you know, put some of those... Uh, either differences or fears aside and really go forward. And, and it's really about building your brand, being able to, to share with folks why they should take an interest in you, whether it's because you may be um, aware of something, whether you have shared interests, uh, find something common between yourself and the other person you're looking to, to, to tag up with. And then from there, really build your communication, really build your network and stay in contact because there's a lot of folks that really want to help each other out. Um, I myself have had the opportunity to go back to my university and meet with uh, with students that are interested in careers in aerospace, whether it's at my company or a different company. And uh, over the years, I've maintained in contact with them, serving as a uh, mentor or just somebody that people go to just when they want to get advice on their next career move. And being able to be in the company, I'm, I'm aware of when opportunity is available and uh, when I have an opportunity to match up somebody that I know with an opportunity that might be coming up with my company, um, I will contact them directly to let them know what to look for. Um, I, we can even send referrals as well. So that's one of the big advantages you have with meeting somebody within the company. They're able to use their internal search tool for jobs and directly send referrals. And referrals are actually one of the first thing that recruiters look for in hiring managers to be able to fill career spots that they have on their staff. Mm -hmm. uh, I totally agree with uh, your uh, suggestion on networking. Uh, definitely it works. Even I landed my first job through networking. Great. So, uh, Carlos, what's your advice to the students of undergrad mechanical engineering to prepare themselves for a future job? Uh, first and foremost, find something that you're interested in and go for it. For example, if it's okay if you're not interested in working in aerospace field, whether it's automotive, whether it's robotics, uh, first of all, be honest with yourself and don't go for something just because it pays more money or because it may be, quote unquote, more uh, illustrious. Really identify what it is that, that you love, what your passion is. And the reason why I say that is because once you start working, whether it's a full-time internship or a career, 
you're going to be doing this, you know, 40, 50, sometimes even 60 hours a week. And if it's something that you don't care about, something that you don't like, or you're passionate about, it's going to be very, very, very long days. And I say that because honestly, there isn't enough money that you can get paid for doing something that you hate all day long. So first and foremost, be honest with yourself. Um, I know some folks that may have been pressured by either family or friends to, you know, get a type of career or study specific field just because, you know, it'd be something that would be more illustrious or something that they cared about more so than the individual. So first and foremost, be honest with yourself. Um, secondly, um, I definitely recommend uh, reaching out and, you know, don't be afraid. Don't hold back. Being able to, to really pursue what it is that you're looking for. Because at the end of the day, you're going to have to be happy with what you choose. Um, and then secondly, this, after you figure out what it is that you're passionate about, definitely get an internship. Uh, whether it's paid or unpaid, uh, fortunately, most engineering internships are paid. But those are great opportunities to really apply what you've learned and really see if that is something that you like. Um, you know, because there sometimes might be differences. Sometimes you may have a perceived notion of what you think a specific or field might be, but then it may turn out to be something different altogether once you actually get an internship. I knew a few folks that started out in engineering, had their first engineering internship, and decided that that's not really what they wanted to do while they were still in school. And the earlier you can do that, the better, because if you are going to switch career paths, switch gears, or switch to a different field of study, the sooner you do that, the better. That way you're not wasting your time and money in, in school so that you can finally get out and do it when you realize that you don't really like it at all. I had the, I was pretty fortunate enough to have two different internships when I was in school uh, for the summer and they were both paid. And they were really great because it really opened my eye to the aerospace industry. Um, I actually got introduced to it by uh, one of the uh, alumni that came back uh, to visit our university. And he was actually the vice president uh, for a specific missile program that I had actually never even heard about. Being able to talk to him and being able to get exposed to that company was really beneficial for me because then actually helped me realize what it is I wanted to do. Um, I mentioned earlier that my degree is in aerospace. So some of those career fields are a little bit more limiting than um, a traditional mechanical engineering degree. Uh, but at the same time, I was actually pretty grateful because I knew I wanted to do aerospace and I was actually able to combine the best of both worlds. I have an aerospace degree, but I'm doing mechanical engineering design work right now. Um, and that's the best because you're able to flex similar experiences. Some of the courses at the undergraduate level are the same for both aerospace engineers and mechanical engineers. So being able to leverage those both industries was really helpful for me. Um, and then once you get the internships, you know, really be honest with yourself again. Did you enjoy it? Did you like it? Did you enjoy the work? Did you enjoy the company? Really ask yourselves these questions because if you still have an opportunity to get more internships, depending on what uh, class level you are in school, uh, you may decide you might want to branch out and do something different. Or you may decide to go back to the same company because you really enjoyed what you were doing and were able to contribute successfully to the success of the program. Um, so really take time to, to pause and reflect. And then if you're not sure, that's okay too. Um, another great opportunity with internships is you're able to establish your career network right away. You're able to identify your mentors that are really going to help you in the long run. And if you're not sure, feel free to start up a conversation with some of those uh, career networks or your mentors because they always know somebody else. That's a, one of the great benefits of networking is that uh, you may know a few people and they may know more people and those people may know more people. And so it kind of just branches out in that approach. So I definitely recommend being able to talk through what some of those mentors may have. They may have contacts of the industries that you may be interested in as well if you decided that you wanted to branch out and do a different type of uh, work for your second or third internships. Um, and then after completing your internships, um, definitely take a chance to reflect on what it is that you want to to pursue once you start working in a career. And also keep in mind that there's a whole slew of other career opportunities, even within mechanical engineering, once you get out to, to those companies. So for example, I know a few mechanical engineers that decided to go into operations engineering. 
And operations engineering is actually great because you're able to expand into other, other fields as well. So I think that's pretty much what, mm -hmm. what I'd like to address for there, but let me know if you have any follow-up questions. Sure, definitely, you know, that's very helpful. Uh, my next question is, uh, what do you think about the future in hypersonic missiles? Yeah, that's actually an interesting field. Um, and I think that's one of the industries we're really going to be able to leverage some of the other brethren and the other disciplines, for example, materials engineering. Um, I haven't been exposed too much to hypersonics in, in, my, in my work, uh, but the little bit that I've heard actually is that materials is really going to be one of the main challenges that we're going to have. Uh, from being able to successfully integrate and complete hypersonic weapons. So if you have a, an interest in pursuing materials as well, hypersonics would be a great opportunity for you able to um, leverage some of those disciplines within mechanical engineering and materials and apply them to really get to, to really tough solutions for tough problems. Um, definitely recommend uh, being able to get more exposure in the materials engineering field would be very beneficial for those in hypersonics. The other one is going to be communication. Um, I know that's something as mechanical engineers, we don't get involved too much. Um, but if you get an opportunity to do a stretch assignment in communications, that's going to be very key, but because we're going to have to be able to maintain contact with the hypersonic weapons during flight. And that's going to be very challenging based upon the, the speeds associated with hypersonic weapons. Great. Uh, Carlos, how do you suggest staying up to date with the industry post-graduation? So one, one uh, good leverage or tool would be able to subscribe to a lot of the uh, magazines that uh, are available in the aerospace field. Uh, there's quite a bit. Actually, I still recall some of the uh, directors at my old job. Uh, they actually maintain a lot of um, their know-how in the industry by, su by subscribing to some of these magazines. And actually, once you get into the companies, you're able to uh, review some of those magazines as well. Um, I know our, our company at Raytheon, they actually subscribe to a lot of magazines that they post in the lobbies. And so being able to maintain um, up to speed on some of the magazines is really helpful. And of course, obviously, a lot of these are online as well. Uh, so being able to subscribe these and also to work with other um, folks in those industries once you build your network. One interesting thing, too, is not everybody stays in the same career field. So you may know some folks that might actually branch out into other fields and uh, they might be tapped into that other industry as well. So being able to maintain contact with them over the, over the years is also very key to being up to speed on, on the industry and where it's going. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. And Carlos, so my next question is, does Raytheon use additive manufacturing? Absolutely. Um, in fact, uh, our engineering directorate a couple of years ago bought um, different types of of 3D printers that they have all over the plant site. You can actually use them for both uh, for business purposes and for personal as well. Um, they provide the filament, so all you have to do is just bring in uh, your design, put in your STL file into the 3D printer and print it out. Um, I know there's other sites, I think it might be in Texas that our company is expanding into building up some of those added manufacturing capabilities um, to go beyond just these personal desktop printers. Um, but we actually incorporate them into our design. Um, not too long ago, about a year or so ago, I, I made a design to help reduce some of the load in one of the components in our missile. And that's a 3D printed part. Um, so there's plenty of opportunity coming up with the added manufacturing field that the aerospace industry is looking to leverage uh, because we want to reduce costs. You want to reduce the cycle time and being able to use these uh, technologies for some of the components that make sense is really the future of where we're going. Um, there's also push for being able to branch out and push some of the current limits of some of these technologies. So that's something that we definitely want to keep uh, tabs on. And the company encourages us to explore and to increase our acumen in that field as well. Thank you. So Carlos, what is the most challenging type of mechanical design for missiles? So for me, the most challenging type is really the materials. And that's because the, the forces imparted by the rocket motor onto the missile are very high from both the vibration and from a shock standpoint. 
And so being able to ensure that you're not gonna break the missile from mechanical design is very key. Um, the other challenging part is being able to design for what we call manufacturing and testability. Um, it's really easy to, to really focus on your design and kind of sometimes get your blinders on and sometimes forget about how that's gonna impact the person that's gonna build it and the person that's gonna be putting and assembling your component into the missile. Um, so I think keeping a key mind of those both items are really important. And of course, we've got software tools and models and test data to help mitigate some of those risks. And it all really comes together once you're trying to put together the missile and you wanna integrate it. And then also when you're gonna go and test it. Um, testing is very expensive and it takes a lot of time. So we wanna make sure we do our due diligence upfront with modeling and simulation um, using our, our software tools that we have at our disposal and can really grow over time based upon past testing is really the way to it. And of course, anything that can be developed to make it faster and quicker without sacrificing the technical integrity of your product is really what the, our upper management is looking from us, individual contributors from an engineer standpoint. Mm -hmm. That's amazing. Uh, Carlos, my next question is, how often does thermodynamics play into your work? Oh, all the time, especially with the, uh, the advancements in electronics. A uh, company is working to put together some advanced electronics to make them smaller, uh, to make them faster, have more capability. Um, one byproduct of that is thermal management issues. And so we've actually broken components because we either underestimated the performance or we actually didn't do our due diligence on, on the thermal management solutions and also the supporting structures for those electronics. Um, so that plays a big part. And if we actually ended up uh, not too long ago creating a new group within the mechanical engineering uh, directorate to focus only on 100% thermal solutions. So we actually now have a core group of what we call subject matter experts uh, that that's all they do all day from a design standpoint is work on thermal management solutions um, to be able to reduce some of the issues that we've seen as a result of these advanced electronics that we're putting into the missiles. Mm -hmm. And uh, are there any company tools available for completing torque analysis of bolted joints? Can you repeat that one more time, please? Uh, so are there any company tools available for completing torque analysis of bolted joints? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we have uh, tools that we use for completing the bolted joints and they're great because you're able to um, add in um, not just your interface, but also brings in automatically a lot of the performance of these fasteners, whether they're nuts, bolts, washers, nuts, um, that uh, ASME has a lot of standards for. So for example, if you're looking for a specific screw uh, that's made out of Crest 304 material, the tool will actually import automatically the, the performance criteria for that fastener. Um, and then it goes a step further, it will actually also import in the material properties for the materials that you're clamping in your bolt joint, whether it's aluminum, steel, um, laminate, whatever you call it, um, the tool is able to bring in those as well, and you're able to play with some of the uh, parameters and make it really tailored to your specific bolted joint. Uh, there's always ways to improve it. I know that there's been a lot of new hire projects to improve some of the tools that we have, so don't ever be uh, satisfied with what you have. Always look for what you can do to make it better, and a lot of those improvements have been incorporated into the tools that we have for bolted joints, and so that's one way uh, to increase, but of course, you know, tools require for you to be very cognizant and diligent and making sure that you've got the right inputs into your scenario. We have a saying called garbage in, garbage out, where if your inputs, you know, aren't really realistic or wrong altogether, then you're going to get results that could be misleading. And we do have some references that we use as guides to kind of do a safety check and sanity check of the results that we're getting from our bolted joint tools. So that's something that we use and actually has improved our efficiency for being able to complete some of those analysis fairly quickly. Mm -hmm. That's helpful. So Carlos, what do you find most challenging about your job? The most challenging I think is sometimes uh, the communication. So for example, being able to bring in the right people 
for reviewing an issue, whether it's a failure, whether it's a new design, um, you want to make sure you're you're bringing in the right folks. And part of that too, especially when you're starting out early in your career, is that you may not know who the right people are. And so you're not communicating effectively to those um, that are part of your either review board or part of your design team. Um, being able to communicate with them what your boundary conditions are, what are your really care abouts, um, and then being able to communicate what you expect the team to complete. Uh, this is one of the uh, tools that I've noticed that a lot of upper management and senior managers are really good at is really identifying not only what's going into your analysis, but also what is coming out. And the reason why I say that is because there are some teams that may decide to, you know, find the perfect solution, but that's going to take too long. It's going to cost too much money. Um, sometimes when you're in school, we don't really learn too much about the cost and schedule um, aspects of a design project. We just focus tech 100% on the technical, but here in the real world, that solution doesn't always work. Um, you may, even though we want to get the perfect design created, it's going to cost too much. It may take forever to procure from a supply chain standpoint. So be able to find a happy medium between what is going to be sufficiently from a technical side and what's going to be within our costs and schedule parameters and constraints. Um, is something that also can get lost in translation. So being able to effectively communicate all that to a design team, it could be very challenging and the results of it could really dictate where the design goes. Mm -hmm. uh, and Carlos, what was your best project in the company? So my best project was being able to redesign a, a missile shroud assembly after failure. Um, we ended up doing uh, vibration testing on the initial design and it failed horribly when it was exposed to Z-axis vibration. It, it physically broke. And so that's not going to work for a missile application. So we had to do a complete redesign of that shroud assembly. We had to use or do a trade study first to evaluate the different materials and the different design options that we had. And it was an effort that probably took about six months from when we started reviewing what caused the failure to when we actually got a prototype um, that was functionally um, perfected and actually worked. So it was a long time. Uh, you get a lot of attention from upper management because uh, sometimes these failures can actually be pacing for a program, which means that the customer won't receive the delivery of the item until you've worked out the technical solution. And so you're being able, or you need to present your progress, not just to your immediate management, but also could be to your chief engineer or a program manager. And that was great because we were able to not just develop the solution, but we're able to do a prototype and actually get it tested. And it really came down to crunch time when we got exposed to that same test environment that created the first failure and seeing your, your design pass the, what we call the critical test was very satisfying and very rewarding and really helps remind you why you got into the, the engineering design field in the first place. So it's a moment of pure uh, emotion and satisfaction of accomplishment. That's great, that's uh, great to hear. And Carlos, what is the best time to apply for full-time positions? Say that again, sorry. Uh, what is the best time to apply for full-time positions? The best time, um, so for my company, it's usually in the fall before you graduate. So if you're a senior in the uh, September or October timeframe, that's the best time to apply because it's such a long process. And I'm not talking about just the interview process, but everything that goes behind the scenes uh, to including background checks, to including uh, paperwork, to including requests for security clearances, if your position is gonna require security clearance. All that takes a lot of time. And so I recommend in the fall really is when you want to start doing that if you were to graduate the next year in the in the spring or summer. Um, so for example, if you are in October, November, that's when you want to start applying for a full-time role if you're going to be graduating in May or, or June of the next year um, because there's so much that goes behind the scenes. And uh, also you want to have ample opportunity to if you're going to have different jobs that you're applying for, you want to give yourself enough time to weigh out the different benefits of each um, because they usually give you a pretty strict time frame. We usually about a week or two after they make you the offer to when you have to accept or decline. Mm -hmm. And Carlos, what traits and skills should a mechanical engineer have to be successful at Raytheon? 
So first and foremost, technical foundation is very key, uh, including being able to, to defend your designs, being able to document your designs are very important. Um, also, the, the people skills really go a long way as well. Uh, so there's really three things that, uh, that management looks for in successful Raytheon engineers. The first one is performance. You know, are you able to accomplish the tasks that you're assigned within reasonable uh, time and being able to develop your end item? The next one is initiative. They also want you to be able to take initiative, whether it's actively looking for improvements in the existing design, whether it's taking initiative to foresee possible issues down the road with a specific design and being able to mitigate some of those risks. Um, and the other one is exposure. You wanna make sure that you get exposed um, and being able to be rewarded for your, your accomplishments. Um, and that's really key at Raytheon, at least here in Tucson, because there's over 10,000 employees. And I think probably about 70 or 75% of those are engineers. So it could be possible that you feel as if you are in a, a small fish in a giant ocean. So I think exposure is really key just so you kind of set yourself apart from some of those engineers as well. Because uh, essentially, you know, you're, you're competing with your peers not necessarily to see who is better, but to bring out the best in each other and being able to grow. I think those are some of the key characteristics that some of the management look for in Raytheon engineers. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Uh, so Carlos, how do manufacturing tolerances influence a missile design? Uh, is geometric dimensioning and tolerancing, that is GD&T, used for design? Oh, absolutely. Um, I mentioned earlier that that's one of the first training sessions that my company sent me to after I started working full time. And that's especially important for future designs, especially when costs and schedule are, are becoming big drivers. You want to make sure that not you only you have a good design, but it's manufacturable and it's not going to cost an exorbitant amount of money to be able to produce what you have. So you, you use GD&T to really get an understanding um, of what is it that you can give your supplier for in terms of tolerances to manufacture your design. And that's really important because you wanna make sure that you give them as much tolerance as possible so that they're able to quote the part at a reasonable price, um, especially for some of these missiles that go into recurring productions in the thousands. Um, you know, any improvement that you can make to, to your design via gd &T can make a big impact down the road when you're gonna be manufacturing you know, just well, not one or two units, but hundreds and thousands of the of these missile parts that are going to go out into the field. Um, so highly recommend usually companies offer uh, GD and T training um, at the beginning, intermediate and advanced levels. So I recommend doing all three if possible. And if you can even understand and get knowledge while you're still in school, that's going to make you more marketable. Talked about earlier about building your brand. If you're able to demonstrate that you have these skills already, then that means the company doesn't have to spend money on somebody else getting trained up if you already bring those skills with you to the table. So then you're more likely to get that job than somebody else that doesn't have those gd &T skills. Mm -hmm. That's great. Uh, so the next question is, have there been any significant changes, changes since the merger with UTC? Not at this time. Um, I think our division at Missiles and Defense um, is somewhat, at least in the immediate and near term, sort of exempt from because UTC doesn't really do missile design. Um, I know that was one of the big drivers for the merger, being able to bring two different companies uh, that can complement each other as opposed to compete with each other. So I think because of that, we haven't seen too many changes, um, at least not yet. Um, I know the company has also said that they're also evaluating what, they, what they're what they gonna be changing. So there may be changes coming down the road. Uh, I know for a fact um, that that would be the case for right now. It's usually just business as usual. My direct supervisor is still the same and so is my department manager. So I haven't really seen much of an impact, um, but I heard some of the other non-technical um, aspects such as perhaps benefits and such uh, could change, um, but for right now, at least through this year, it looks like it's going to be business as normal. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And uh, Carlos, as a mechanical engineer, what is your take on having computer science knowledge in the industry? Oh, I think that's very key, um, especially because that's really gets to the brains of our missiles. So for us mechanical uh, designers, we're able to really build the, the structure and the support 
uh, for a lot of the components, but it's really the programming and the software that drives the brains of the missiles. So if you're able to bring some of those skill sets to the forefront, that's going to make you very valuable um, for in the eyes of our management, because that's really where a lot of the issues have come up as well. I've seen on different missile programs and even different companies, that's usually the software that kind of is at the end of, of the development phase. And that's because they need to first make sure that the hardware is working correctly. So if you can bring some of those and be able to assist to work in some of the challenging software issues, um, that is gonna be very beneficial. I've actually been involved as well as some of the, some of the flight test failures that, to, that we've had. And a lot of the solutions for those actually are derived from the software and programming to, for some of the hardware shortcomings. So if you bring that skill set to the table, that's going to make you much more valuable and be able to contribute directly to the success and, re and recovery of, uh, of a flight test failure. Mm -hmm. That's very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Carlos, how many upgrades are driven by internal reasons versus a request from customers? Oh, pretty much uh, the main majority of the upfront requirements are driven by the customer. Uh, luckily, we're able to put ourselves in those initial negotiations with the customer. Um, and we really bring that understanding because at the end of the day, you know, we're the contractor to the customer. The customer can't build a missile, they need our help to do that. And so we're able to insert ourselves to really drive and shape some of those requirements. Um, sometimes what they're looking for, we could identify early on as being a significant schedule or cost driver. And if that's important to the customer, they may decide to scale back on some of that capability. You know, it's essentially a, a trade-off. Do you want more capability up front, realizing it's going to cost a little bit more and take a little bit longer to develop? Or is what you're going to get eventually good enough uh, to get you within your cost and schedule constraints? So that's a big driver. And luckily, we're able to shape and negotiate with the customer uh, some of those requirements up front that will really have a big trickle-down effect with the rest of the system once we get into the design phase. Mm -hmm. OK. And Carlos, you mentioned about uh, security clearance earlier in one of the answers. So is the recent graduates uh, required to have a security clearance to get hired? No, they're not required to have a clearance, but they will be submitted for clearances early on, especially if they're going to be given an offer. And that's one of the reasons why I really encourage you to apply, you know, up to, you know, eight or nine months ahead of time, um, because some of the positions will require security clearance. Uh, you don't necessarily need to get one on your own. That's something that the company will get for you. Um, that's another good advantage of an internship. If you have an internship with our company and your role is going to require security clearance, it can actually put you in for that while you're still in school. So that way, when you are actually graduating and be working full time, it's more likely than not that you already have been granted that security clearance when you're working full time. Mm -hmm. OK. Carlos, as we're reaching at the top of the hour, I'll just take a few more questions, okay, and then we'll wrap up. So my next question is, uh, are there any company tools available for completing thermal or structural analysis of assemblies? Yes, absolutely. Uh, we use a lot of the commercial tools as well. Uh, ANSI is one that comes to mind for structural analysis. Of course, we have a tailored version for our industry that we use at Raytheon. Uh, but those tools are very powerful for completing structural analysis uh, for thermal solutions as well. I know that we actually have both commercial tools and homegrown tools, depending on what type of thermal analysis is required. Um, there's differences between doing a thermal and structural analysis of an entire missile uh, compared to doing you know, individual electronic components on the circuit card assembly, for example. And so there's different suites of tools and a lot of those are anchored and benchmarked on existing test data. Um, but of course, as we're looking to develop new materials, uh, new advanced electronics, those tools need to be updated to reflect um, what is currently out there in industry and what we're looking for the future. So we do have a lot of software tools available for those, which would actually help us uh, with identifying er early issues early on with our designs and making sure that we incorporate any design updates before we go to test because it's really expensive to test. And so if you can hammer out some of those deficiencies up, hit, up ahead with your, your software tools and modeling, that's going to save you a lot of time and headache down the road. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And how often does testing result in failure of a product? And what is the process for design after that failure? Well, that's a good question. Um, so 
I'd say probably in my experience, we've probably failed about 25% of the time that we've gone into testing. And the recovery effort is really heavily dependent on what the failure mechanism was. Um, so for example, I talked about my example earlier where it took us about six months to, um, to fix a structural failure on the shroud assembly. Uh, we have actually had flight test issues that we were able to resolve via software. Um, and that took a lot less. That probably took only about three months or so to resolve a flight test failure. Um, a lot of that also depends on the energy and, and visibility that the failure gets. So a lot of times upper management, especially chief engineers, uh, will offer their services to help resolve issues. And that can actually help improve the process and get it quicker. But of course, it depends on priority and being able to balance what other failures are going on at the same time. Mm -hmm. Okay. And what are the softwares that you use extensively as an employee of uh, Raytheon? So for mechanical design, uh, we use a software tool called Creo for 3D parametric design. Uh, that's actually one tool that I had exposed to when I was still in college. So I was really fortunate to have been able to learn that tool when I was still in school and apply that. I think that's also one of the skill sets that I also help differentiate myself from other folks. Um, I know there's a lot of good commercial tools out there, for example, SolidWorks for 3D modeling and design, um, but our company at this time only focuses on Creo. So if you're interested in working for Raytheon, I know <coughs> 3D modeling design is one skill set that you definitely want to have. Great. So Carlos, uh, I think we have reached to the top of the hour. We have uh, covered most of the questions. It's still there are I would say 10 to 15% of the questions left. So just the last question, what one advice do you have for all of our attendees to become successful in their mechanical engineering career? Do not be afraid to ask questions. I know for a lot of folks, especially myself included, early on, you kind of, especially when you're starting out, you feel that if you ask too many questions, you're gonna be bothering folks or they don't want to help you. And in fact, uh, myself and others, you actually run into the complete opposite. A lot of people want to be able to help you. They want to see you succeed. And that's mostly because when they're in the same position as you, somebody helped them out too. Um, mentors are a big source, not only for technical design, but also for career growth and, and progress. So please don't be shy. Ask a lot of questions. Ask the right kind of questions and get to the right people as well because there's a lot of folks that are gonna be able to help you out and be able to embrace that help and don't be shy. Thank you so much, Carlos, for your time and for sharing your knowledge, insights and advice. That was really, really helpful. Thank you for so, having me. No problem. So thank you all very much for participating in today's webinar. I hope you all enjoyed it and found it insightful. The webinar has been recorded and will be available online at www.asme.org in a few days. And lastly, in a few minutes, we'll send you a, a short survey. Please be so kind and give us your feedback so we can bring you speakers and topics that are of most interest to you in the future. Thank you again and see you soon on our next webinar in July. Thank you very much.